Feel good fathers, thanks so much for tuning in today. I'm pretty excited because this, what we're gonna talk about with my buddy here, Dave, is about college, university, kind of get into that. He is the scholarship coach. He helps high school and college students navigate the scholarship and uh, financial aid world. You can find out much more about this information at nodebtcollege.com. That's N-O-D-E-B-T-C-O-L-L-E-G-E.com. And this is particularly important because we are right in the season. When this episode will air, it's right in the season of starting this process. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to doing this. Excellent. How did you get into helping uh, students navigate these scholarship waters? It was very selfish. Um, well, selfish for, <laughs> for our family, at least. Um, I wanted to make sure that my son graduated college without student loan debt. Hmm. When he started high school, I realized college was not too far behind. You know, he was born and then he was in high school, it seemed like the next day. So I realized college was going to be pretty quick on the horizon. And I had heard that college had gotten really expensive. Now, people were saying that when I was his age and yeah, college wasn't cheap, but a student could could work their way through school. I still feel like at that point. But when I looked into what it was going to cost my son, I just I had a heart attack. We had not saved anywhere near enough to achieve that goal of getting him through college without student loan debt. And I kind of panicked. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I knew scholarships were a thing, but I didn't apply for any scholarships when I was uh, going to college. So I had to, to learn about it. And I spent about a year um, just educating myself on what scholarships are. How do you find them? How do you win them? Um, how can they be applied to college? Just, you know, the whole nuts and bolts of, of the whole thing. And so um, did that for about a year. By his junior year is when he applied for his first scholarship. Um, now, I'll throw out there, I wish we had started even sooner, and that would be my first bit of advice to anybody watching is um, start start today. Even if your your child's in grade school, there are scholarships out there. But anyways, he started his his junior year, and we were fortunate that he uh, had... Yeah. I, I'd love to say, even if they're in grade school, there are scholarships yeah. out there. Yeah. What th This is something I haven't necessarily heard of as much, and I'm sure that the Feel Good Fathers haven't. What sure. Can you provide some light on what you're, what you're mentioning? Yeah, so um, most of the scholarships uh, for grade school students, first of all, there there are not a ton. I, I want to be upfront about that. So don't expect you're going to fund your entire kid's college by the time they're going into middle school. But um, the types of scholarships that are out there are you're going to find things like um, essay contests, art contests. Um, they're provided through typically philanthropic organizations. Um, so like the VFW is one that um, middle school and high school students can apply for. Their sister organization, the VFW Auxiliary, um, has several different opportunities, including an art contest um, that students as young as, as grade school can can apply for. What, so, what's the VFW? Yeah, uh, Veterans of Foreign War. Sorry. Got it. Yeah. So it's an organization that um, is advocates on behalf of, of veterans. Awesome. What other uh, is this common? Uh, it's not super common, but there's enough that I think it's a great idea to get kids started for two reasons. Of course, one, you might actually win some money to set aside for college. That would be you know, a great reason. But I think a better reason is that it gets them into the habit of applying for scholarships at a young age. They're going to get better at it. So by the time they are in high school, when the majority of, of opportunities open, they're going to have a, a huge leg up on their, their uh, competition, for lack of a better word. Um, and it just gets them in the mindset of, okay, this is what our family does. We're, we apply for scholarships, just like we go to school or we do whatever chores are common in our family. So it's just, it becomes part of your, your family's lifestyle. I think, I think it's okay to call uh, competing for a scholarship a competition. It, yeah, I think, it, 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 I think it's a reality. Is. Yeah, <laughs> yep, it, it definitely is. Yeah. Um, and one of the, the nice things about those VFW scholarships I mentioned is that, yes, it's a competition, but they give away thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of, of different prizes every year. So, yeah, you're competing for that top spot. But heck, if you come in 100th place and you win a few hundred bucks, especially as a grade school student, that's a great motivator, a great way to get started. Yeah. And I think from some other previous guests on the show, you know, put that into a uh money market into a couple of stocks, like 10 years on some dividends or in a high growth, you know, well, 
in a very secure, right? We're, we're earning, we're putting this money in a place where it's going to earn its interest and compound it over time. I certainly would not suggest taking your, your kid's scholarship money and putting that into high risk, high risk no, securities no. or stocks, but certainly putting it into a money market account or, a, or some sort of dividend, dividend stock and having that just accrue and grow that can, that can be significant. You could have 500 bucks into uh, maybe a couple hundred more, maybe a thousand dollars and hundred percent growth on that cash is it's not bad. Yeah, ever. absolutely. Or even um, putting it into a, like a 529 plan, a college savings plan, especially if you don't have the funds yourself to fund, fund that type of plan. This is another way to do that. And before we get into the scholarship process, I would love to have you sort of break down for the feel good father was the 529. I'm super happy you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I will say I'm not an expert on, on 529 plans. Um, if you want really in-depth advice, I would, I would speak to a financial advisor, but I can tell you as a layman what I know and, and what we did. So we did, we did have a small 529 that we were, we started funding probably around um, late middle school, early, early high school. And basically a 529, I think of it kind of like a 401k or an IRA for college savings. So you open an account, um, most of the, well, first of all, every state has their own 529, but you don't have to fund your 529 in the state that you reside. So learn about pretty much all of them, uh, or at least as many as you can find the one that works best for you. Um, they all have different rates of return. Um, they have different requirements. But basically, you put the money in. Um, most of them don't require a set uh, amount to start or a set um, monthly or yearly deposit. But put as much as you can in. Um, that's that the money in those accounts belongs to the student, and it does need to be used for college or some type of higher education. So it could be trade school. Now they did just make a change this year um, that didn't apply to me, so I don't know as much about it, but I believe that if you have a 529 and the student ends up not going to school, I believe it can be rolled into um, a retirement account for that student at that point. So I'm not 100% sure on that. Like I said, that's a little outside my range of expertise, but I do know there were, were some changes made that made it even more attractive to, to look into 529s. I think for the Feel Good Fathers, what we're taking away here is Number one, there are some knowledge and things that are out there, but number two, yeah. there's simply the action. And so part of what we can do is educate ourselves on what's available for us to set our kids up for success, whether or not they go to college, whether or not they, you know, how, in what, whatever capacity that is and decide whether that's right for our family. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your kid is going to hopefully do something productive. College is one path, but it's not the only path by any means, but um, setting them up for success, whatever their path is. Um, I feel like that was my job as a father. So that was, that was my motivation is I wanted to make sure my, my son had every chance that he could have and set him up for success. Awesome. Awesome. Great, great perspective, Dave. Really appreciate that. So let's jump into sort of the, the steps Maybe a little bit of the, the process and the path that you walked, and then maybe just a high level overview of what are the steps that a new father coming in or a new mother for that matter, coming in and navigating the scholarship world, what, what steps could they take? Yeah. Um, well, I actually, I have kind of um, put together what I call a five-step process for winning scholarships. So step one is extremely obvious. You have to find them. Um, now, how do you find them? That's not quite as obvious. Um, the first thing I'll say is local scholarships are going to be your best opportunity just because your student's going to face much less competition. So local scholarships can be found um, if your student goes to a, a traditional school, public or, or private. Most of those schools will keep a list of local scholarships. So talk to your guidance counselor. Um, that would be absolutely the best place to start. Beyond that, um, look at the businesses that you patronize from your doctor, your dentist, your insurance company, your local grocery store, your electric provider, all of these companies that you're spending money with regularly, they may have a scholarship. Um, scholarships are one of the ways that um, businesses market themselves. It's kind of their, their goodwill tool to the public. So find out if the businesses that you patronize offer those opportunities, or even if it's maybe I don't know, a grocery store in your area that you don't usually shop at, still check them out anyways. So hmm. again, those local opportunities will be your top bet. 
Beyond that, you want to focus on scholarships that match to your students' interests and abilities at, um, from national scholarship providers. So for my son, he was um, extremely interested in history. He, even from a young age, he said he wanted to become a history professor. So we found scholarships that focused on history or social studies type um, questions or essays or projects. So that was our kind of secondary focus after those local scholarships. Now you can find those on um, websites like uh, scholarships.com, Scholarship Owl. Um, there's about a dozen really, really good scholarship websites. Now you'll want to tap into a lot of those, but you will start to see a lot of the same scholarships popping up. So um, the reason to tap into a lot of them is that even though there's a lot of overlap, there will be some unique scholarships in each of those databases. So those your, are really your, your two best sources are going to be through your school. And I will say if you if you homeschool or your student doesn't go to a, a, a brick and mortar school, just go find your closest local high school and look at their website and see if you can find scholarships there. Got it. So step one, hunt, hunt and gather. <laughs> yeah, exactly. go find them. Exactly. Yeah, put the legwork in. Great. And yep. I think that's a, and I actually think this is a really great opportunity and you, you probably agree is that there's a, a certain amount of effort that you can put in, but I think even then having your son or daughter take on some of this work as well, especially in today's, you know, in today's climate, you know, using large language models, using Google, I think even Google has their large language model integrated. If you're using edge, uh, chat GPT is integrated. So you can find that and say like, Hey, Give me a list of local scholarships given this zip code, you know, see, exactly. what, see what happens. So it, yeah. it seems yep. like this step, which used to probably be a little bit more arduous given today's climate is going to be probably one of the easiest steps. Yeah, um, I, it's it's very easy, but it can be time consuming. Now, some of those tools you mentioned are definitely great aids and um, definitely things, especially if, if you're already using these, these tools, tap into those, use those. Um, but even so, it is a time-consuming process. It's not difficult to find scholarships, um, but it, it does take some time. And yes, that is a great piece of this puzzle that, that parents can be involved in. Um, now, there are some steps later on that the parents can't do much with because it's going to be up to the student. But this is one piece that the, the parents could be, and I, I recommend should be involved in. Awesome. Okay. What What's step two? Yeah. So step two is now you have this huge list of scholarships. What do you do? Where do you start? Um, you need to filter that list and find the, the scholarships that are the best target for your student. So we talked a little bit about that already. Start with local scholarships. Beyond that, um, as the scholarships kind of expand geographically in terms of who's eligible, look for those scholarships that match to your student's interests and strengths, whether that's their academic interest um, or it could be their extracurriculars, could be sports related, could be arts related. Um, do they volunteer at some place that has a specific focus? You know, one, one of the students I worked with, she just loved animals. She wanted to become a vet tech. And so we found scholarships for her that were related to working with animals. And um, she was had some success with that. So, you know, whatever your student's interest, you're, there is probably a scholarship for that. Um, so, yeah, step number two is filtering that list and finding the ones that are the best match. Now, you're going to find still several that um, they're, you know, scholarship A and scholarship B are both great matches. So then, okay, which one is due first? Let's work on that. Unless the one that's due second um, might have a lot of hoops to jump through. So say a large essay, whereas the, the one due sooner is just a quick application. Well, make sure you, that you give yourself enough time to complete whatever steps are required. Got it. So step one is filter by due date. Sort of. I mean, we're kind of moving through. I would say sub step B is filter by due date. Yeah. Sub step C is filter by effort. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Okay. And there's, there's a little bit of an art to this of, um, you know, some students, they can, they can blow out a 500 word essay in an hour or two. Other students, a 500 word essay is a major project that's going to take weeks or maybe even a month. So it, it depends on the student, um, you know, and that's where partnering with your student and being kind of that coach um, is really, I think, you know, the parent's job to the degree, to the, the degree that they are willing and able to do it. And then 
to the degree they need some some outside help is kind of where where I work with with families. I, I think for the focused father, uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry for all you listening. I dropped my pen. I had to pick it down. So for all you listening, that's what happened. And for all you watching, thanks for the humor. Uh, <laughs> laugh with me. One one core thing I wanted to bring up here that I thought was really meaningful is uh, uh, we're really playing this game to win. Yeah, this is, you know, part of this filtering step, you know, when you said target the best for your student, Mm -hmm. I I think that we're one of the the core elements of, um, I think of the real world, right, is that sometimes you win and lose. And I remember when I was applying for college, it was, I I actually, it's funny, it it hurt at the time, but I remember applying to some schools and there are some schools that getting that rejection letter, I thought was really meaningful, like some Mm -hmm. really solid, uh, failure, some things to learn from in that perspective. And I think even in this world, like teaching our son and daughter that effort, uh, consistent effort, uh, it's like, we're, we're going through this right now. So my youngest daughter is in sixth or my oldest daughter is in sixth grade. Okay. And we're showing her now. So we live in a state where if she gets great, if she gets good grades, she has, she basically gets free school. Yeah. Yep. And so that's a, so we're in Tennessee and that's one of the perks of being a resident here. And so we're just like, look, just do the effort. Yeah. Just yeah, put in the effort. You get the grades. It's like, if you can hit high school and you can do A's, you know, maybe B's the whole time. Just like, I forget what the qualifying amount is. I think it's just like decent grades all the way through and they go all the way back to middle school. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's part of the, one of the, one of the criteria there, uh, that free school, I was, I, I talk about it with my, my wife all the time. This is hundreds of thousands. This is, this is going to be a huge investment in her future Yes. to get that either to go to a trade school, which we're, mm-hmm. we're, like, my wife has a trade degree, right? She's got a certificate. Okay. I've got a traditional bachelor's mm-hmm. that whichever route, route she, she picks, having that on the dime of the state, I think is fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's, it's just a, that head start. It's similar to what you're talking about with these scholarships. Yeah. So, yep. And that, that brings up a great point is that there are other states that have similar programs. We're in Florida. We have something called the Bright Futures Program, which my son qualified for. Um, now, he ended up choosing to go to a private school out of state, but we were able to make that decision because of the private scholarships we had won. If, if we had not followed that path, then Bright Futures would have been um, a great opportunity for him. So one of the things I like to tell people is that scholarships really give you freedom. Um, Mm -hmm. The more you have in that scholarship bank, the more freedom your student's going to have to make the choice to go to a school that maybe would have been financially out of reach before. Um, Also having those scholarship wins on their resume um, as they're applying to colleges, if this this is one reason to apply early is put those wins on, on the student's resume. It makes them stand out as an applicant. And that actually brings up one other thing is that kids don't apply for much. Like as adults, we apply for everything from jobs to mortgages to, you know, whatever kids, maybe when they turn 16 might apply for a job that might be their first, first application ever. Um, applying for college is extremely daunting. And if you get your student applying for scholarships before that, they have that application muscle built a little bit better. Um, so they're just going to be a better college applicant as well. Yeah. It'll set them up as well in a character perspective for a little bit more resilience. Yes. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. 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 That rejection. Um, I mean, a good winning percentage for scholarships would be 20%. Like that would be, that would be like the Babe Ruth of scholarships. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah. Kids will, will need to be prepared for rejection. The other thing it, it prepares them for is delayed gratification because even mm. when they win, it's going to be months before they find out whether they, they actually did win. Um, it, it can be really tough, even for me when I'm working with students. Um, you know, I have some who are graduating this year, class of 2024, and they've been at it for a long time and they have yet to see a win. Now, I'm confident they will, but like, you know, they applied for things back in um, November, December that they don't know if they've won or not. And that can be tough. It's it's tough to, to wait that out, but it does build character. And um, these are these are skills and traits that the students are going to need the rest of their lives. Love it. What's number three? Uh, number three. So is you found the scholarships, you filtered your list and you said, this is the one we're applying for. Step three is application. So I talk to scholarship providers every day and they all tell me the same thing. We reject 
upwards of 90% of the applications we receive because the student didn't follow the directions. Wow. So step number, step A in step three of applying is simply follow the directions. Just make a checklist of everything that they want, whether it's an essay, if it is an essay, what specifically are you supposed to be writing about? Make sure you hit all the points in the prompt. If they want letters of recommendation, how many and from whom? If they want transcripts, do they need to be official or unofficial? Do they need to have um, scores from my current semester? Whatever it is that the scholarship is asking for, make sure you get them that. And you will, you will beat your competition significantly just by following directions. Love it. What are the, what would be the, I mean, this one seems a little bit more straightforward. There might not be a follow-up question here. I was thinking of what are, what are the hidden gotchas uh, on this step? Um, I think that if there is one, it would be if it's an essay or some scholarships are moving more to like a video essay type thing. Um, if the prompt has multiple questions you're supposed to answer, make sure that you hit all of those. So, um, I was before before we started the conversation today, I was looking at a scholarship and the essay had two parts. Now, I can't off the top of my head tell you what they were, but it was like, write about this and tell us about part A and part B. Even with this, the students I work with, I'll, they'll send me a first draft of an essay and they've only answered part A. So just kind of make a checklist of, of whatever the, the requirements are and check those off as you're as you're going through the application. And, yeah. and of course, a big one is hit that deadline. Um, and you want to hit the deadline, I think, try to shoot for like three days before. Um, scholarships are not obliged to extend the window because you failed to meet the deadline. And they're not obliged to extend the window if their website fails. Um, I've literally seen that where students will wait till the, the day of the application deadline and the website fails. The website goes down and they'll come back the next day or two and say, we're really sorry, but we're not changing the deadline because this, this website failure was our, our host or provider or whatever. So it wasn't our fault. So getting in early gives you time for those unexpected um, little hiccups that you, that um, are likely to pop up. I think it's, this is another one of those great life lessons. I, I think a lot about having a project, a project or homework done before the date, uh, yeah. even in sixth grade, we're now starting to get multi-week assignments. So the due dates mm -hmm. multi-weeks right. out. And yep. even in that world, I'm like, hey, eldest, <laughs> let's get this done so we can iterate. Yep. And I, I remember really early, I said, look, you care. She she loves mythology. It's, it's a, something okay. that we share together. Yeah. She loves Greek mythology. And a lot of her social studies uh, projects are typically like, read this one thing, write about what you like. And she's always picks like, Oh, I do Greek mythology. She, that's just kind of yeah. where she's at right now. And I always say like, Hey, you, you know, so much about this world. And she's got at least a dozen books in it. She's read, she's reading Percy Jackson. So she has that kind of perspective on it. Right. She's got the more academic side of like, you know, there's more, there's a couple more, more his, historically accurate versions of the mythology that aren't mm -hmm. fiction based. Right. And I always say like, Hey, this, this stuff jazzes you up. So why not just start now? Like, sure. It's, it's yeah. due in two weeks, but right. you can get this done in a couple of days. You could have it sit there and then do another iteration and come back and refine and make it more polished. And all these different elements, they, they, uh, they add a, a better product. And I say the other thing as well is, cause I think kids, you know, uh, kids at this age, they don't have the better, the best sense of time. Yes. So it's, yes. it's much better to complete projects when you're calm and you have the space mm -hmm. and you can fill in the blanks than being pressed in the last day or two before it's due and cramming in. You know, I, I remember once she did a booklet, it was like, she, well, she had to create, she waited, she had to create like a 20 page booklet in like a night. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and thank goodness that she knew the material, right? So we weren't yeah. combining learning the material with creating it. She already knew it because it was her passion. Right. On the other side, I just remember turning to her and saying, like, you've had this due for a while. This could have been, we could have done one page a day. And mm -hmm. now it wouldn't, we wouldn't be pressing into the evening because we, you know, we sacrifice relaxation time, sacrifice just, sit, you know, doing activities as a family and just like, all right, we're sitting at the table. 
let's go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, that's a great point. Um, students, I'm going to say 99% of students, even really um, highly motivated and, um, you know, the top students, they don't really have the executive function to succeed in scholarship, the world of scholarships on their own. They need um, a partner and mom and dad are probably going to be the best partner. Um, now, kind of my role is to supplement that, um, you know, I can, I can offload some of that for the parents, um, especially like if they're not, if they don't feel qualified to review essays and things like that. But the, the parent still needs to be involved to keep the student on track, um, regardless of whether you're working with somebody outside or not. And um, yeah, that, that executive function piece is, is really critical. And um, students' brains at that age, they're just not developed for that. That's, that's not how kids are built. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why the parents really, having them involved is going to really improve the success. You hear that feel good fathers? Get involved. <laughs> <laughs> involved, yeah. I think yep. I think this really echoes the sentiment I've heard from a lot of my teachers and a sentiment that I echoed and heard from almost all of her coaches. So Aldis has done roller skating. She's now doing archery. She's oh, done cool. art. She's done all these other activities outside of school. She's done Taekwondo. And mm -hmm. in each of those scenarios, it was like, yes, having the coach, having the specialist, having the whatever. Uh, be the primary provider of motivation, direction, guidance, and coaching is great. But parents should, you should always, always be involved and you don't need to be an expert, right? right. To support yes. my daughter in archery. I don't know. How to, I don't know. How to do an uh -huh. Like I'm, I'm going, yeah. I'm going to go figure out how to shoot a bow, but right, I didn't yeah. need to do that to support her. I didn't need to know how to do these roller skating things to do it. I didn't need to know how to support, like to do Taekwondo to support her in that effort. But yeah. some of the yep. critical parts of, keep putting your effort in, maintain focus, keep going, don't give up. Every day is not going to feel great. Most, you know, yeah. a third of the days are going to feel bad. A third yep. of the days are going to feel mediocre. And then a third of the days you're going to have a really great time. You know, and, and that's usually in the fight to get in the car. We're driving to yeah. the activity. Let's go. Right. <laughs> right. All right. We're, yeah. we're digressing yep. and I'm sharing a little bit and it's super fun, but what's step four? No, no, that's great. Well, before I get to, to that, I did want to say one other thing that um, parents can do um, because scholarships, you know, it is a, it's a project. It's, it's now you'll find some where it's, Hey, fill out a, a, an application in 30 seconds, do those, but don't count on those. Cause they're going to get a million entries, but for scholarships that, that require some effort, break it into smaller pieces and have um, deadlines for those pieces. So let's say, you know, your, your high school sophomore is going to apply for X scholarship there and there's a 500 word essay. Well, it's due in a month. How about this week? What's due to, to me as, as mom or dad is um, the first draft or even an outline. And then, you know, break that up so that it's a little bit more manageable to them. Um, and that way, if something does come up, you, you still have time to, to kind of course correct and, and hit that deadline. Awesome. Love it. Okay. Number four. Yeah. Step four. So step four is tracking your scholarships. Now, part of that um, is just, you know, when you build that list, I, we use that as our tracking tool. We had this, this list of scholarships that were, we were going to apply for. And then as he applied, we just checked it off and we would mark the date that we were expecting to hear a yes or a no. Now, a dirty little secret of the world of scholarships is that they very rarely hit their own deadlines for announcements, <laughs> but they're usually close. So they're usually within a week or two. Sure. So that can that can be super frustrating, especially if you've waited for months already and now they're they're late. But um, it's important to track the ones that you've applied for, and kind of a subset of that is um, knowing those deadlines. But as you are looking at that scholarship before you've applied see if they're providing information about previous winners, whether it's just a little bio on it, or if it's like an essay or a video based, is their project from, from the last year's winner posted? And what can we learn about that winner? Even if the essay prompt or the video prompt is different, you can probably get a clue of what the scholarship provider liked about that scholarship. So I love this combination and I, I, the, the part one of the combination being help with the project management of what's going on. Yeah. We're not doing yep. the work. And I, I've, I, right. feel, I feel terrible every once in a while for the student when 
I, I remember in when my oldest was in grade school, just walking in to see the student projects and being like, there's no way. Yeah. There's no yeah. way that that seven-year-old yep. put that together. You're in yep. first or second grade. Uh-uh. <laughs> that didn't yeah. happen. I know. I know yeah. that was mom and dad. And I yep. think that yeah. um, it certainly sets up your kids for failure I, I, in, a, yes. in, the, in the worst way to do the work for them. But I absolutely love the concept here because it's a teachable moment. And it's a skill transfer. So mm-hmm. while setting up the breakdown or the, the deadlines in the project, we can be educating our kids on how we're doing this, right? Okay. So you've got, right? Like I love the example of this essay because I think it's the mm-hmm. most, most breakdown. We could use the video, but video I think would be step two. So check this out. Yeah. So mm-hmm. we know that we've got a 500 word essay. We, we know as adults, well, how would I do that? Probably a little bit of research, probably a little bit of an outline, probably a rough first draft, maybe some key paragraphs, just kind of start writing. And then finally making sure it hits, I think, I think probably at this age with most essays, it's like intro body paragraphs closing, right? So it's like super straightforward formula. So Mm -hmm. even in that world, if I was setting up a project, uh, we're not yet at the, if you haven't figured this out, we're not yet at the essay stage yet for oldest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that to me would be great. So final product, then I would do the breakdown and I would say, okay, well, you know, you at least need your three parts. Is your intro good? Is the body good? Is the closing good? Okay. So that would be the step before. And for those of you listening, I'm pantomiming on my hand from the front, <laughs> from the front of the, uh, the project completion, all the way stepping back. And these, right. I think, and I'm not going to continue with the example, but this is just a simple way to do that. Now, I'm in marketing, and so I do a lot of uh, webinar, website review, copywriting, and we did a, something similar where my daughter and I, uh, we built a actually a webinar to sell uh, cookies for a fundraiser. <laughs> so awesome. It was, okay. It was super fun, and, and what we did yeah. was we knew, okay, well, there's a finished product, which is the video. Mm-hmm. But before that, we needed the outline. We needed to understand the product. And so what I said was, and we did it basically in a day, but it was about two, it was basically like a three hour, have fun, two movies uh-huh. worth of time together. And the okay. first part was I said, well, tell me about the cookies. I was like, mm-hmm. tell me about, like it was an Otis Spunkmeyer thing. And it was like, okay. tell me about these cookies. Okay, great. Tell me about, tell me about the competition. Okay, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Tell me about this thing. And then we got into creative. Okay, so here's how I know, because I know how to build a webinar. And so I broke that down. Uh, I broke down like, okay, well, these are the core steps. And I just walked her through uh, implementing the creative and then we recorded. And then I said, and then the final piece was, that was about the first hour, hour and a half. Now mind you, it's like a five, five minute webinar. So you can see the preparation. Okay, yeah, yeah. Then we recorded and then we went back through and I opened up. Uh, I happen to use DaVinci Resolve. I think for those of you listening, for you fathers and mothers listening, this is the the number one free video editing and audio editing piece of software you can get. And we just kind of spruced it up because I knew it was a video. So we just spruced it up and did some Uh stuff. And now we have this permanent video that it's created a great, great memory for her. It's a Mm -hmm. great product. She's got a little bit of things, a little bit of experience on creating a, a piece of digital marketing, which is infinitely valuable in today's market oh, and, and, and tomorrow. Yeah. And now we can do it another again. So she's good on camera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But all that came from breaking apart, similar to these scholarships, breaking apart that project yeah. and, and yeah. helping her succeed in the best way possible without, and I did none of the creative. I did none okay. of it. Yeah. All I did was fantastic. was the prompts because I knew again it's that razor of not doing it for her and allowing her to have that success her own and it's hers she she owns it yeah yeah that's right yep um yeah if a student wins a scholarship and they are not the ones who did it they don't get that that sense of pride so yes there's that um, and that brings up a really good point of the parent involvement now unfortunately most of the the students I see, they probably have too little parent involvement, mm-hmm. but there are a couple who have too much and you cannot write your students essay for scholarships. You shouldn't write their essay for their college applications. You shouldn't be writing their essays for their schoolwork. So the work needs to be the students. Now you can, you can serve as editor. That's perfectly legit. Um, professional writers have editors. So it's perfectly fine for a student to have an adult editor. 
The other thing is they should not be relying on chat GPT to write their essays. Mm -hmm. Um, They're probably going to get found out first of all. And secondly, it it's cheating. It's, you know, it's, it's corking the bat in baseball or it's, you know, whatever the the sports analogy would be. So yeah. um, Parents have that involvement, but cut, cut yourself short of writing that essay. I will even say um, depending on what the scholarship literally says on in their rules on their website, it might be okay for you to even fill out the application because especially, you know, a high school senior, um, they know what their name and their address is. So you're not doing something they couldn't do. You're just helping them with a little bit of time. But I have seen some scholarships that say this must be filled out by the student. Well, then mom and dad, you you need to let the student fill it out. But um, yeah, you know, know where where that line is and and try to make sure that that you and your student are are not crossing that. I'm a little bit out of touch with the completion of these, but the core question for me here was how many of them are hand, like pen paper, and how many of them are digital nowadays? Uh, It is very rare that anything is, is handwritten anymore. It's almost all digital. Even some small local scholarships will typically um, have like a Google doc that you can fill out. Um, you might run into senior year, a few local scholarships who, who are still a little old fashioned where you have to go to the guidance office and get their form that you fill out by hand. But that's extremely rare. Got it. All right, Dave, what's number five? <laughs> Step five is winning. What do you do when you win a scholarship? Um, I Literally, the first thing I tell students and parents is when you win a scholarship, celebrate. It is an accomplishment. It doesn't matter if it's a hundred dollars or ten thousand dollars it is something to be proud of and you want to make sure that you as the parent let the student know that you are are proud of them for this accomplishment and for the work they put in to do it so take time to celebrate after the celebration is done find out exactly what you need to do to claim the prize scholarships can have a very narrow window to claim your prize i've seen some as short as 72 hours so kind of part one or five b is get your student in the habit of checking their email every day. They check their social media every day. They need to check their email every day, especially when they're applying for scholarships, because when that scholarship, when notification comes in their inbox, the clock is ticking. And like I said, it could be as short as 72 hours. Typically scholarships are going to want to see anything from just verifying your information. Hey, is, is this the right address for us to send you a check? It could be, especially as they're, high school seniors going into college. All right, you, you are the winner, but we want proof that you're going to college. So you need to send us an acceptance letter, or you need to send us your enrollment, um, proof of enrollment that you've actually signed up for classes for the fall, whatever it is, get that information to the scholarship as soon as you can make sure that you hit their deadlines. And this is again, another piece that the parents should be involved in, um, that executive function, even for, for high school seniors is still, Maybe not quite where it needs to be. So, but I, I mentioned checking the email every day. Um, kind of a pro tip related to that is set up an email address that you and your students share and that's exclusive for scholarships or maybe scholarships plus college applications. And that way you can keep an eye on it even when your kid maybe fails to check that email every day. I think one, just, just to interject, because I think this is super fantastic. One piece of advice that I would give parents, and I, I'm not big on giving advice, but this is a tactical, this is a tactical implementation thing that you can do. Be number yeah. one, reserve an email, a professional looking email yes. of your yes. student's name on Google. So yep. typically you'll maybe like first name, middle initial, last name. There's enough variety in the world outside of like, you know, John L. Smith. <laughs> you know, like I think yeah. there's enough variety out in the world where you can, you can reserve that. But number two, you can learn about the filters of those different systems. doesn't matter if yeah. it's Hotmail, Yahoo, Gmail, whatever future provider, uh, you know, whatever it happens to be, you can typically filter on maybe scholarship or scholar or a couple different words and mm-hmm. forward and create simple automation that will mm-hmm. notify you, set alarm bells, do whatever it needs to be to make sure that it happens without, without you checking that student's email for yourself. So you can then be yeah. in sort of a reactionary world. Uh, number three, I would say, please don't have your students. Uh, this is a, as a point of mental health. 
<laughs> don't let your students check social media every single day. Put some boundaries uh, yes. around that. I, I like that. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll be happier. They'll be happier. Yes. Uh, number two, uh, uh, one of the things I think that has had a tremendous impact for me and my career and my success and many others is just that calendar management. And so I think yeah. this is another one of those opportunities to set your student up, set your son or daughter up for success in a way that you can teach them the basics of how to manage their calendar and set yeah. deadlines and set follow up dates and all the other kind of jazz. So I know that was a, a whole bunch at once, but the core principle was when they're young, reserve their name it's for an email address that looks professional. Then number two, within those systems, I always suggest Google because Google's great. Um, uh, would be that they have a great filtration system that can forward and reply and do all these crazy things that just make sure that you know, and you can you can set like I could set up right now where the email comes in, and I would get a text. Hey, by the way, you got an email about a scholarship. Yeah. And so like it's right on my phone. The phone buzzes like, oh, that'd be fantastic to know. Yes. Um, yeah, that's great. I love that. And something else you said that is I think really important is professional. Um, let's say the scholarship has narrowed it down to your student and the other student. One of their email addresses is first name dot last name. And the other is Taylor Swift fan. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. that could matter. It literally could matter. So just being professional. And I, I think first name, last name is, is probably your best format. And, and for the record, we love our Swifties and we love Taylor, <laughs> right? We love what she's doing. Uh, but yeah, I, I completely yeah. agree. I, my, yeah. <laughs> Funny story. My email address for the longest time was Magenta Dragon. That okay. was that was the email address for the longest time. Okay. And then basically, when I got into high school, I was like, you know, let me do this and this, and and yeah. just completely change yep. it. And yep. and that did. And I I can tell you, as a person who has received resumes and stuff like that, looking at that email address and saying, really, like this hotmail is the one, this is the one you want to send me. Right. You know, right, like yeah, you never yeah. want to get some of the other more creative, creative versions. Uh, but I can absolutely see that professionalism and it sets, and I think it sets people up to, um, it allows our students to have the professional identity, which is what college and all that other kind of stuff and these scholarships should all be about. Right. Right. Um, kind of echoing one other thing you said about social media and yeah, I agree. Um, the less time students spend on social media, the less time all of us spend on social media, probably the better off we're going to be. Um, but related to that, to the extent that your your student is on social media, um, make them aware that scholarships and colleges are looking at that. And so what they post, what they like, what they retweet, whatever, that matters. And um, less is probably better uh, because it's hard to make a mistake if you're not doing something. Um, but to the extent that you are posting or sharing or whatever, um, make sure it's not something you would not want your college admissions decision maker to, to find out about. I, I love this point. Even in sixth grade, where my eldest is in sixth grade right now, she talked about th this is hot out the press. They had somebody came in that was a, uh, I would say a white hat hacker. So that means that a hacker who's testing defenses that's on our good side, right? They're testing security, testing information. And what this person said was, and they, and I think the person did it live. They did some searches and they found a, a person who was prolific posting all the time and mm -hmm. all the details that they could pull from that person versus somebody that was much more quiet on social media and yeah. how much more private it was. And a lot of it was based on pictures. And so okay. we in the feel good fatherhood community and myself, I absolutely promote don't post pictures of your family online. Yeah. I uh, think that's a good, good advice. Just on the, on, on this little piece, this is a little bit far off scholarships, but the whole principle is that it removes the autonomy of your son or daughter of their image and likeness online. And it provides, right. um, and it, and it can provide fodder, uh, for some, in, in the case of something as important as a scholarship for their, for their college, which we, we've, we've discussed in a handful of moments that it is a significant financial decision for yeah. you and the student that can have long reaching and long lasting impact on their ability to succeed in the world. I've seen people crushed by debt at high, yes. at, that are unable to make decisions, unable to take mitigated risks, maybe to go to a startup or start their own business because they have to have a certain amount of earning just to cover their student debt. Right. Yeah. So, so all this is going on, uh, Dave, uh, it's been a fantastic conversation. What, what are your kind of closing points off, off the five, 
the five steps of the no, no debt college.com of, of, of getting these scholarships. Yeah. Well, I would just say, I'm going to um, maybe go a little bit different direction instead of reiterating the five points. Cause we, we did go into quite a bit of detail, but um, one would be um, don't feel like your student won't qualify for scholarships. There are scholarships for every student, um, regardless of their academic abilities, their athletic abilities, artistic abilities. Um, many scholarships, don't even ask what the, the student's GPA or test score is. So that's the first thing. Um, there, there are scholarships for pretty much any student who wants to, to find them. Um, the second would be, be careful of where you're getting scholarship advice. Um, I see supposed college-related experts giving advice like, don't apply for national scholarships, they're too hard to win. If we had followed that advice, um, my son would be probably $60,000 in student debt. So, yes, you, you want to prioritize local scholarships. Yes, you want to prioritize the right scholarships. But just because it's a big national scholarship doesn't mean you shouldn't give it a shot. Um, there are about a dozen, maybe 15 scholarships that open up during the fall of a student's senior year of high school that they're high dollar, but they give a ton of prizes. So, yeah, you might not win the $50,000 top prize from Burger King, but would you like a thousand bucks? They give away four thousand for one thousand dollar prizes, so that's pretty good odds. Um, they don't look at your GPA either, so telling somebody to not apply for that scholarship, I think, is just foolish. Um, so just be careful where you're, where you're getting your your advice on this, and um, I guess follow your gut. I mean, apply to as many scholarships as you can. You know, apply to the best ones first, but. Those tier two scholarships that you're going to be surprised and you're going to be surprised at some of the tier one scholarships that you don't get. We, one of the biggest uh, lessons we learned for, for my son was, like I said, he was really interested in history. There was one we had more or less said, yeah, th you're going to get this. And he didn't. Um, so there is just, there's kind of that unknown factor. Um, we don't know, you know, this other student who did get it obviously did something a little bit different or better than my son. And, and that was okay. But um, don't, don't count your chickens before they're hatched and don't throw those chickens out before you try to hatch them either. <laughs> <laughs> Sage advice, Dave Peterson, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for having me.